want to welcome everybody here this morning as we gather on this Lord's Day to worship our God together. I'm sure at some point in our lives, especially if we've uh, been around enough to have experience in trying to talk to people who maybe knew us when we were younger, that at some point, I'm sure whether they were members of the church or not, whether it was a conversation dealing with the Bible or spiritual matters or not, at some point we've encountered uh, perhaps some sort of resistance to something that we're saying or some uh, discussion, whether it be of, whether it be of uh, some kind of a secular nature or not, simply because these individuals knew us when we were little. Sometimes when people see us grow up and they know who we are and who our family is and where we've been and uh, what we've done, sometimes that can have a, uh, a tendency to prevent people from uh, really paying attention and really taking to heart the things that are being said. In Luke chapter 4, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, we have an event that takes place with Jesus as he's preaching to people in his home country. Luke chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 28. Jesus has taught, and in verse 28, all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city. They led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Keep in mind that this is the region from which Jesus came. This is, these are people who knew Jesus when he was growing up. They knew his family. They knew his brothers. These are people who know him. And they got so angry that they were prepared to cast him off the cliff. And what, and what might very well be some sort of a miracle or work of God, verse 30... Somehow Jesus passed through the midst of them and went his way and preventing them from putting him to death. Whatever it was that he did or said upset them to such a degree. You, you tend to think that even on the one hand, perhaps some people may not pay as much attention to us or, or take what we say um, uh, seriously because they knew us when we were little, when we were growing up. But by that same token, you would think then that it would be much more difficult to get them upset. It would be much harder to get them this angry. So why did the people get so upset? Why did they get so angry and mad? We're going to look at Luke chapter, we're going to look at Luke chapter 4, and we're going to notice what the context is so that we can understand why the people got so upset. Turn with me back to verse 16. We're going to start in verse 16 because this is the beginning of the context of what's taking place here in Nazareth. Luke chapter 4, starting with verse 16, talking about Christ. He came up to Nazareth, or he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable, the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book. He gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal, thy, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent, except to Zarephath, in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. 
Many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So, verse 28, when all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and they rose up, and they were prepared to cast him over the cliff. What is it in this text that Jesus specifically says to make them so angry as to be prepared to kill him? That's what we're going to talk about. We want to understand what it is, the, the point that Jesus is attempting to make with these people that they obviously got. They, they obviously got the, the point that he's trying to make to them. So much so that it inspired such wrath from his home home country, his home city, home region, people who knew him. When we consider the idea of physician heal thyself, Jesus says in verse 23, you will surely say to me, physician heal thyself. The idea being, show us what you're capable of doing. As he says, do whatever you have heard done in Capernaum, do also in your country. We've heard of the signs and the wonders that you've done in Capernaum and in other places. Why don't you perform those here as well? Show us your power. There's nothing specifically wrong with wanting proof. I mean, we know that Jesus' own brothers in John chapter 7, his own brothers at the beginning did not believe he was who he said he was. We know with the example of Thomas, for instance, a lot of times we call him Doubting Thomas. But keep in mind that the other apostles, the other ten, remember uh, Judas had killed himself, though, so there was eleven at that point. The other ten, they had had the opportunity to see Jesus risen from the dead. Thomas has not had that opportunity just yet. So uh, when you consider Thomas and the fact that Jesus, when he appeared to him, he, Thomas was all in at that point. Uh, my Lord and my God. And in that text, Jesus makes a statement, you see me and believe, but blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. We also know from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, that by many infallible proofs, Jesus made himself known to the brethren after those days, during the, during the time that he was walking on this earth, after he was raised, before he ascended into heaven, Proof was given, and according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, up to five and a brethren at once were present when Jesus appeared to them. Proof is, there's nothing wrong with wanting something concrete to be able to base a foundation of faith upon. We have that ourselves. Our faith is not a blind faith. We base it upon the eyewitness testimony of those who were there, who saw Jesus not just alive, not just who was crucified, but actually saw him raised from the dead. They saw him ascend into heaven. We base our faith upon their eyewitness testimony. Our faith is not baseless. There's nothing wrong with wanting proof. But what's interesting here is when you notice in Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 38, turn with me to Matthew chapter 12 and in verse 38, notice what takes place here. Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 38, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And Jesus says in verse 39, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jesus isn't saying that I'm, I'm not capable of showing you a sign. He's choosing not to because of the state of the hearts of the Pharisees and the scribes. They, we want to see a sign from you. You don't want to see a sign from me. They aren't going to believe. Even, in fact, there's this description of even after Jesus had risen from the dead and the soldiers give their testimony about what had happened at that tomb, the Sanhedrin just swept it under the rug chose to ignore the implications. They said, Let, just make sure you tell everybody that the disciples came and stole the body. Time and time again, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the rulers of the people, showed a propensity to be able to ignore 
the greater implications of the events that took place with Jesus. Case in point, the very thing that ultimately led to the last week of Jesus' life, it started with Lazarus being raised from the dead. After that event was when the Sanhedrin put forward a major effort, not just to kill Jesus, but to kill Lazarus as well. Keep in mind, Lazarus, he had been, he, he, he was decomposing in that tomb. He smelled. This was something that was reported. He was dead. They don't come any deader. And Jesus raised him from the dead. That's proof. That's a sign. And yet the Sanhedrin and the rulers of the Jews, the scribes, the Pharisees ignored it. That's what they, they, they showed a, a knack for being able to do that. So when Jesus responds here in verse 39, he is describing not the people at large. I mean, he offered signs of miracles. He healed people. But with regard to the heart of those who were asking, we seek a sign. And even an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. You will not have a sign except for the sign of the prophet Jonah in reference to the three days that he would spend, Jesus would, in the ground and then be raised. In Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13, this is the passage that Ben read for us a few minutes ago. Matthew chapter 13 and in verse 53, it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there, when he'd come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue and they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is, his, is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? When, where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. We know, based on the text in Luke chapter 4, what it was that Jesus said that offended them, although we haven't covered yet why they were offended, but we know what it was he said. They were offended at him, but Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Because Jesus couldn't do many mighty works? No. Because it wouldn't have done any good. See, the signs and the miracles that Jesus performed, and even going forward with the apostles, they were for a purpose. They were to confirm the word of those who were preaching and teaching. In this case, with Jesus, these miracles served the purpose of confirming he was the Son of God. In fact, we covered a couple weeks ago about Jesus emphasizing his own authority. Don't just take my word for it. See my works. My works declare where I'm from and upon the authority that I do what I do. I come from the Father. The Father gives me the authority to do these things. When we consider, turn back to Luke if you would, Luke chapter 4. When we consider the words of Jesus, that he speaks to his home, his home country, the people who saw him grow up. Notice what it is that Jesus, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, verse 24, no prophet is accepted in his own country because of this predisposition to ignore individuals that they saw grow up and now you're trying to teach us but I tell you truly many widows notice how Jesus is going to go into describing some history with regard to Elijah and he's going to describe uh, some the fact of what Jesus or uh, of what uh, Elijah and Elisha did as they were sent to do the works that God told them to do so when Jesus goes through this and he describes all of this to them this is where the situation arises for which they get so angry. This is where it all starts. Notice he says he, he calls himself a prophet for one thing. No prophet is accepted in his own country. To a certain extent, Jesus is referencing himself in this. He uses Elijah and Elisha, but he puts himself in that same category with them. In addition, keep in mind of the passage that he read from Isaiah in the synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to send me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. From Isaiah. 
So we really have three prophets that have already been referenced in this situation. Elijah, Elisha, and Isaiah. And all of this leads back to the people when they see, hear him say these things. But in their mind, they're not seeing this 30 some odd man who can do miracles. They've heard the reports from Capernaum. They know what they've heard that he's capable of doing. But now they, they want to see it. Is this not Joseph's son? They allow their familiarity with Jesus and his family to warp their understanding of what it was Jesus is saying, what he's teaching. Consider, when we consider verse 25 through 27, notice what Jesus' point is. I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah. But was Elijah sent to them? No. And yet, did Israel acknowledge Elijah as a prophet? Yeah. Did they acknowledge that he has power of God? Yeah. Even though he was sent to the widow of Zarephath, he was still sent from God. And then in verse 27, many lepers were in Israel in time of Elisha the prophet, but he didn't heal any there. He healed Naaman the Syrian. These are all coming straight out of the Old Testament. And so one of the embedded points that Jesus makes here is just because I don't do any signs, does that make it any less of a fact that I am indeed from God? Why do you have to have a sign in order to believe? They wanted a sign to convince them rather than allowing the word to inspire belief and then that sign confirming that this is indeed who he says he is. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. When we consider what the people, how they observed this, in John chapter 10 and in verse 41, the statement is made, the observation is made that John the Baptist did no miracles. He didn't do any miracles. And yet, all of the people acknowledged him as a prophet. A prophet. He did no miracles. So upon what did they base their judgment of John the Baptist as a prophet? His words. His wisdom. His teaching. Why can't Jesus fit in that category too? You've got Isaiah, you've got Elijah, you've got Elisha, you've got John the Baptist, they're all prophets. But in these situations that they perform miracles in Israel, no. Yet they were still received based on what they said. Or acknowledged as prophets based on what they said. A lot of times they were rejected. Jesus in this case, oh, do a miracle, Jesus. Show us your power. But is that enough? to cause the people to react the way they did in verse 28, 29, and 30. Is it enough that Jesus says, you guys want a sign, but, but you really need to pay attention to the words I'm saying. It shouldn't take signs for you to understand and, and believe. Is that all it was? Or is there more to it? It's interesting Jesus mentions Capernaum. Because Capernaum isn't a part of Israel. Capernaum was a Samaritan city. When you consider the fact that Jesus had done these works there, but he won't do them among his own people. And then he mentions Elijah and Elisha. There is a specific point embedded there that the people immediately got. He's recognizing Elijah and Elisha who did miracles for Gentiles. And yet they were rejected by their own people. Jesus is likening himself to those same prophets who did miracles for Gentiles and they had far greater faith than Israel did. Or in this case, from their home country, Nazareth. They didn't listen. They didn't want to obey. They didn't want to believe because, oh, isn't that little man Joseph's son? Oh, we saw him when he was yea high to 
you know, to, I forget the phrase, yay hi to whatever it is. They remember him when he was growing up. And because of that predisposition of thought, of, of mind, of attitude, they refused to listen to what he said. So what difference is it going to make if he does a miracle? What difference does it make if he shows a sign? They're not going to believe. That's why Matthew chapter 13 goes into, he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. It wasn't because he couldn't. Because that wasn't, that's not the purpose of those works. It's not the purpose of the miracles. To inspire uh, people to, in order to believe when they obviously just wanted to be, to see these wonders. It wasn't going to do anything. It wasn't going to confirm in their mind that he was who he said he was. And here in verse 28, when they react, when they hear these things, they're filled with wrath. Why? Because they couldn't contradict him. Jesus is quoting Old Testament. Yeah, it happened. Did God send him to these Gentiles? Yes, he did. Did Israel accept Elijah and Elisha? No, they didn't. The same thing's happening now. And immediately they were convicted. And instead of reacting in an appropriate way, instead they reacted in anger. As time and time again, human beings have shown themselves naturally to want to do. To react emotionally. To react in an angry way way. They wanted signs. They had no intention of paying attention to what those signs meant. That's what Israel did. That's what the Sanhedrin did time and time again. Sign after sign after sign. And yet the implication of those signs completely lost on them. To believe they had to accept that Jesus was sent from God. That he wasn't just Joseph's son, this little guy running around. That he wasn't just the brother of these fellows and he was on his sisters. No, this, this fellow was sent from God. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. They weren't going to accept that. Because of this roadblock they had made in their minds, based on their familiarity with him. All of this leads us to situations that we ourselves have been through in our lives. Either because we have been rejected based, not necessarily just again on scripture, but just perhaps situations that we've been in where we've tried to convince somebody of something, but because they've known us all our lives, there's that stumbling block in the way that they just can't get over, can't get past it that maybe there's something that we know that they don't. Maybe there's something we've learned in our experiences that they maybe haven't gone through yet. But what if it's on the other shoe? Or what if, what if the shoe's on the other foot? What if it's us in the place of these people? Somebody we're familiar with that tells us something that perhaps we don't really want to hear. Something that convicts us. Maybe it's somebody younger than we are. Maybe it's somebody we've seen and watched grow up and they say something or they do something and we realize perhaps in some form or fashion that we're not what we should be. The human instinct is to react in anger, to reject it. But what God wants us to do is to pay attention to what our character should be which is to receive correction. It doesn't matter where that correction comes from. We need to be able to take the words of God and rely on the eyewitness testimony of those who did what, or who saw and wrote down what they saw. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. These people in Luke chapter 4 wanted a sign. Thomas wanted to see. And again, wanting that established proof is one thing. But Jesus tells Thomas, you see me and believe. Blessed are those who do not see and yet still believe. Who are assured of me because of the report of those who have seen me. Who know that Jesus is the Son of God. We need to make sure that when we're faced with words that convict us, especially coming from someone that perhaps we think shouldn't be able to teach us anything. 
young whippersnappers coming up and saying stuff. Maybe it convicts us in some form or fashion in things that we're not doing that we should be doing, or something we are doing that we shouldn't be doing. You know, a lot of times, there are times when we get into habits, and maybe these habits aren't necessarily a good influence. Maybe this is something we don't even think about until somebody younger than us points it out. We need to make sure that we don't become defensive or strike back. We need to make sure that we don't just dismiss it or let our judgment become warped or, in the case here, I'll prepare to somebody, throw somebody off a cliff because of it. When we consider the lesson of Luke chapter 4 and what took place here, we need to remember how important it is to look inward to examine ourselves to make sure that we're the best servant of God that we can be. Paul told Timothy, let no man despise your youth, but be an example of the believers in word and conduct and faith and purity and so forth. Because the tendency is to reject those who are younger than us, those who we're used to, those who we've seen. But it's important for us to take God's word, no matter who's delivering it, no matter where it's coming from, no matter what example it might be, if it's God's word and it's something we're supposed to be paying attention to, we should not dismiss it because of the messenger. Well, that's a, a lesson for us. It's, you know, Luke chapter 4 is one of those texts that we might read every once in a while, but I can't remember the last time I heard a sermon on it. So I hope it's something that's beneficial for us to take a look at something very specific in the life of Jesus that made his own city, his own people so mad, so angry, they were prepared to kill him. But imagine, I mean, Jesus knew it was going to happen, but at the same time, Jesus is a human being. These are people he grew up with, and here they are prepared to kill him simply because he was telling the truth and teaching God's word. It's important that we're prepared no matter what, to listen to what God's Word has to say to make application in our lives. That's the lesson for you this morning. We want to offer an invitation to those who are not Christians to become part of the body of Christ, to have your sins washed away, being baptized, be added to the body. Those of us who are Christians, let's make sure that we're being objective with the Word of God not dismissing it because of the, out of the mouth for whom it, it's coming, but rather making sure that we're addressing God's Word and that we're applying it in our lives. If you're subject this morning, please come forward as we stand and sing.